Hello, uh, my name is Mark Hammond. Welcome to this lecture which talks about student fees and fair access to universities. Uh, as the slide says, I'm a visiting fellow here at Bath and a visiting professor in public policy at Canterbury Christchurch University. Uh, what I want to talk about this morning uh, is a number of things. Briefly to talk about the history of the growth of universities as a background to why the policy debates around student fees took place and how we've reached the position we have at the moment. So that will touch on the story of student fees, how they were introduced uh, and the rises we've had since. I also want to talk a little bit about future issues and options. Uh, obviously that's very live for all of you, uh, particularly with the impacts of Covid and lockdowns and the extent to which normal university life has had to be interrupted over the last 12 months. And I should probably say, in the interest of transparency, I have a very personal interest in this, as my son is a second year student uh, and has been home with us doing remote learning for a large part of the last 12 months. So we're well aware of the impacts, I think, that it's had on many of you. And what I hope we'll all get out of the lecture and the talk today is to illustrate how politics and policy making doesn't always work for the best uh, and what are the issues and concerns and challenges are for all those who are going to be taking decisions about university fees and access over the next few years when we may well see a further set of important changes affecting everybody. So as background to what we're going to talk about I wanted to try and illustrate the very substantial changes that have taken place around university access and the numbers of students over the last 70 years, and particularly how those changes accelerated uh, after around 1990. I'm sure you're well aware of this story in many ways. So for example, on this slide, you can see that back in 1950, only 3.4% of 18-year-olds would go on to a university place. When I went up to university in 1980, that was 11.1%. So quite a substantial increase over those 30 years, but still a very low proportion of the population as a whole. However, between 1980 and today, 2020 say, when we're over 50% of 18-year-olds going into university courses, there's obviously been a massive increase. That increase took place first of all through 1990 to 2000, uh, where it was close to doubling, and then a further 50% increase over the last 20 years. And of course, this is a fantastic achievement for the country. In many ways, this, this is one of the great success stories in social policy making over the last generation. To see that huge increase in the number of 18 year olds who have the opportunity to go to university in itself but also, more importantly, the opportunities that gives everybody going forward for the rest of their lives and working careers. And you can see just illustrated in the diagram here how those lines have changed, particularly since 1960, and where the dark blue of undergraduates joining universities, the total number of students, uh, increases so rapidly after 1990. And I also just wanted to stress as well, in the, the lighter blue at the top of the graph, the increase in postgraduate studying is in some ways even more startling than that of undergraduates. Whereas back even in 1990, the number of postgraduate students was really very small in the UK. That has increased hugely over the last 30 years. And of course, what that means is more and more people have the opportunity not only to study and achieve an undergraduate degree, but to go on to masters, to go on to PhDs and other qualifications. And for the country as a whole, this is a huge asset and a huge achievement that so many more young people are able to take academic study to those higher levels, matching the higher levels that many of our competitor advanced economies uh, were also achieving sometimes before us. So overall, as a social policy, this has been a huge success story. But naturally, behind that success, there have had to be decisions taken about how it is all funded by the state, by universities, and of course, by all of you, by individual students. 
and the enormous change that took place in the introduction and then the rises in student fees that underpinned this increase in student numbers. So let me take the story right back to, well, the 1820s really, when there were two universities in England, uh, no prizes for naming them. But at that stage, England was actually a long way behind some other European countries. Back then, 200 years ago, two universities in England, but 34 in Germany and 23 in Spain. Uh, and many other countries had significantly more higher education uh, than England had at that stage. Back then, of course, there was no state funding of any kind in the university sector. And even when we gradually, after that, saw University College London and then Durham in 1826 and 1832 created, the new universities that started to increase capacity in the sector were also themselves private foundations. Some of the universities that succeeded Oxford and Cambridge were built on the foundation of early medical schools, which was one of the first areas where higher education increased. Others grew out of Church of England seminaries, training for the priesthood, gradually expanding into training in higher education for different areas. And some of the major expansions that then took place in the late 19th century was concentrated in the north and midlands of England. So we saw between 1900 and 1910, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, new universities created in those parts of the North and Midlands. And that growth, of course, was driven by much wider socio-economic factors that were in play at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th. You'll all know, of course, changes in economy and society, the Industrial Revolution, had started to call for new skills much higher numbers of graduates, those who had the skills and knowledge and to drive the new industries, essentially science and technology, beyond the traditional learning of Latin and Greek for universities, there was a much greater call in the economy for those who had the skills in chemistry, physics, maths, to support the new industries being driven through the Industrial Revolution. And as though that Industrial Revolution expanded the middle class in Britain beyond traditional old money, upper class money, those in the middle classes wanted their children, particularly their sons, I'm afraid, to have the opportunity for university education, which those of the upper classes had taken for granted for so many decades. So the emphasis on science and technology, the wish of the expanding middle class to have the opportunity for their descendants to have university education with all that implied, and the drivers of the new economy across Britain meant that there was a great expansion very quickly at the end of the 19th century, early 20th relatively, to provide the capacity to meet that demand. And we were doing very much the same as other European countries, Germany, France, Italy and so on, to create that new capacity for very much the same reasons. And across Western Europe, and indeed across in the United States, you'd see this drive. However, those changes having taken place, the structure of universities didn't change greatly over the next 50 years through to the end of the Second World War. We saw small increases in the number of institutions and a gradual rise in student numbers, which might seem, going from 2 to 20-odd, to be very successful, but still represented a tiny proportion of the population. And when the First World War occurred in 1914-18, with the numbers of students taken out of the university sector because they were volunteering to fight, there was a great financial crisis across the universities. And in 1919, the University Grants Committee was set up by the government of the day to channel state funding for the first time into universities, essentially, to avoid them going bankrupt. And the Grants Committee was to be a key player in the funding of universities for the next 70 years. So its foundation at the end of World War I to help prop up the failing finances of the sector was a critical step. And although there wasn't in very limited state funding, through various sources, some 50% of the very small number of students attending university at the time 
did have some kind of access to grants, scholarships, bursaries, often provided by philanthropists, by the universities through their own resources and wealth, but it did mean that there was some opportunity for a small number of people, but at least for some, to attend university without having access to the family resources that would otherwise have been needed. So between 1945 and 1963, although there were huge changes taking place across the economy and society as a result of World War II, there was actually very slow change in the university sector compared to some others. It was very clear to the Labour government coming in in 1945 and to those that succeeded it that a major expansion in universities' education would be needed in the decades that followed. Technological advances had been accelerated greatly by the war. There was a recognition that far more scientists, for example, were going to be needed to drive the economy in the future. And the Labour government of 1945 saw that it would need to make substantial changes across most of society. The foundation of the NHS, the creation of the welfare state. Back in 1944, the Butler Education Act focused on compulsory access for secondary and vocational education for everybody. But post-war economic and financial pressures also meant that it took a considerable time to marshal the policies and the politics which would lead to substantial action around the university sector. At this point I'm going to take a break and in a moment you'll be able to pick up uh, in the next section of the lecture uh, on the site. Thanks. <laughs>